interesting or inspiring person by Palladio went on to be discussed in terms of overcoming slowly physical form. Think about what within the modern was, um, doesn't matter, there are many of those slides who sh show you history on, on the left side and abstraction on the right side. But it's clear that naturally what you see on the right, right side is also physical, but it tries to be not physical. And all propaganda says it is not physical. Gideon said there is nothing left of decoration, but I see many decorations. Anyway, this is a problem of modern interpretation. Okay, think about what the dis different positions within modern were. Behrens says uh, in 1913, let's look to the problem. What is it? Is the Eiffel Tower really architecture? Well, he says no. No, architecture must be built. He says architecture, the essential of architecture is Körpergestaltung. That's his position. Or think about Le Corbusier. What does he say? He accepts volume as a basic principle. You know. But what says Gideon, when uh, Le Corbusier goes to Italy to uh, meet Mussolini, he says, be aware, be aware. We must be very clear and consistent in defending a modern view of architecture which is based exclusively on modern materials and modern construction. But Le Corbusier is a little bit Latin and he likes uh, bodies and uh, so he goes to Italy where at the same time Piacentini would say, Valore plastico, that's not Piacentini's invention, as we know, but yes, is capable of integrating such values or such entities. For Piacentini, facadismus, uh, making facade, is applied to such things, and facadismus for Gropius naturally is historical architecture. So we are in a conflict uh, on and full of contradiction between what is really a body and what is not. But it is clear that everyone wo wants to make a distinction between uh, an architecture which is built on bodies and which is not. So physicality is a problem in dealing with uh, palladium. Second schism, that's history. Now, um, I have with me a text which I consider still being a basic text of the 20th century architecture when it comes to history. That's Rainer Bannon's manifesto of brutalism. And uh, this is uh, an absolutely important basic text. And when you reread it, you should read page one, the s s page one, the following sentence. <laughs> and it is entirely characteristic of the new brutalism, our first native, our first native art movement since new art history arrived here. So he links brutalism with that fact that Britain finally has art history. It cannot be separated for, from it. There's a consciousness that the modern must now, from now on, be compared with this pos possibility to have and to uh, develop history. And next page, he will say what he believes history should be. And naturally, he doesn't say, now go to Vicenza and look for Palladio, but he says, we, modern, must have history. And he speaks about the necessity to form a recent history to work on the recent history of history and calls it the inner history of the modern movement. So what does he do? He pleads for a history, but he says, we make history of the modern. So he maintains the schism, he maintains it, but he understands that after one generation, two, three generations, probably we have history between, I, I often try to say to the students when they are repeating any Corbusierian door, he said, yes, that's historicism of modern, yes. <laughs> anyway, we have this problem that history is something which is not denied, but it is, there's a schism about what history should be. Should we form history within our modern world, or should history be something more universal? Third of these schisms is about method. And this has been introduced a uh, while ago by Howard Burns. Howard Burns made the point when he said, Palladio, he said, failed 
to have read Wittkower's architecture principles. That's, <laughs> that's all about this problem here, method. And probably it's the most important. And uh, we are not going to criticize Conrad or Wittkower, but we must understand why in their condition, in their um, uh, context, uh, method was applied as it was applied. And again, it is clear that Wittkower um, had uh, an interest to reduce uh, to a pattern, as had Colin Rowe. Colin Rowe uses the word dogmatic when he speaks of Palladia. He uses it. He looks for it. And this is not aware of contextuality. Think about what Gropius says when he comes from Germany to London. He has here at the Royal Academy this famous um, uh, speech on what, what is about modern uh, architecture and planning in 1934. And he starts saying, we can prove that modern architecture, architecture is based on a logically uh, conclusive base. This was an interest. Uh, it should be scientific, not as we speak, uh, not scientific as com uh, compared to um, to um, Palladio. Scientific meant to be logical. You know, you had here Mr. Popper. You know, think about that. Popper a little bit later would exclude Geisteswissenschaften as they couldn't be logical. You know, there was such a sharp distinction between thinking ways which would be straightforward logical and the rest, you know. So Wittkover was not isolated when he presented such schemes. Uh, Colin Rowe wasn't isolated, but again, in order to be logical in such a context, you had to reduce the amount of criteria. you had to reduce the complexity of mathematics to a very few items and so on. Um, pattern is not in an isolated, is not isolated in its context. Speak, uh, think about the later dis uh, discussion between the two major friends, Christopher Alexander and Peter Eisenman. You know that they hate each other when it came to such issues. But this was the moment. People were looking for the conclusive base of an architecture. So that's therein I tried to see Wittkover and I tried to see Colin Rowe. I put it still a little bit further. Um, in 1936, the philosopher Edmund Husserl, which is eventually not so much read in Britain, I don't know, Edmund Husserl wrote his famous last piece, which uh, was published actually in Belgrade, and the title, very obscure, <laughs> the title was Crisis der Europäischen Wissenschaft. And within that uh, discussion, he would uh, describe his view of the world, and he makes an opposition, schism, between mathematisierung, mathematisierung, and that what we have lo uh, lost. What did we lose? We lost Lebenszusammenhang, we, lo the we lost the integration in life. Um, German philosophy uh, knows that Lebenswissenschaft goes back to life, and mathematisieren is that danger. It's not wrong, it's that danger by which you might go beyond what is needed in a cultural um, uh, contextuality. The words which you can read in the whole tradition of German philosophy and art history too, they are always streng. Have we a strenge Kunstwissenschaft were the words of, uh, uh, of um, Sedlmayr a conflict within which Se uh, young Wittkover was involved. Have we a strenge philosophie, was the question uh, Husserl put on as early as 1910. Exact was the other word, you know. These were the leading words. This is obviously one of the uh, important uh, demands which is ident identified with this, with this modern word. You have to be exact, you have to be streng. When you're really streng, you lose many things which are empirical or which are beyond that particular word. I could now read uh, specific quotes on that hustle, but I will not insist. It uh, seems to me that it is important that the conclusion of such an analysis must be we cannot go into Palladianism, we cannot go into Palladio, when as long as we do not overcome our modern prejudices, as long as we do not understand that there was a specific kind of looking to history, 
as opposed to another one, as long as we do not understand that the, there was this constraint of being so seriously mathematical redu reductive, we cannot understand it, and naturally we cannot understand it when we do not finally accept it, that the whole modern tradition is full of um, um, uh, uh, contradiction when it comes to corporality, physicality, and abstractness. This is the, the, the message, or this is the, uh, the beginning of uh, what we have to use when we go to abstraction. I can add, add a few things. Um, um, Peter Eisenman, yeah. uh, you said diagram. Um, naturally, we, we are not free of all these fashions, you know. Uh, Peter Eisenman studied, you know, all that story with Colin Rowe. And um, with Colin Rowe, he went to Italy. And the first uh, step into Italy of Peter Eisenman was Como. And in Como, he found his palladio. His palladio was Terranni. And it was quite clear, I know that right now, uh, Peter Eisenman speaks about palladio since we have a jubilee. But it's quite clear that uh, there was a big attempt to find anal analogous situations or analogous uh, material to make or to improve or to go on with this analysis. Still, when Peter Eisman did it, he was not so totally reductive as many would believe. He started to make drawings of concrete buildings. He was more art historically educated than we would believe today. Still, his master Colin Rowe, his master Colin Rowe, when he wrote back in his last years, uh, published in, or what was published by Caragon, uh, 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 his last book, he had a little text. And in this little text, Colin Rowe explains by himself what this schisma was. And he said, this was naturally a private antagonism to wit cover, but he said, there are two kinds of human beings when it comes to architecture, those who uh, speak, uh, when I speak to Howard Burns, that's for erudition, you know, you are art historians. And when I speak to an architect, that's the language, studio language. And he says, only studio language, no, only studio language can raise enthusiasm. The rest is just for the books, for erudition. This was a clear distinction. And I can confess that I by, se by myself was a, a victim when in Zurich, uh, Colin Rowe's friend, Bernard Hersley, was teaching, was so clear. An architect, only an architect, is able to speak about architecture. The problem is that the historian knows that this is not the modern invention. You can read that in Baldinucci, the whole, the whole conflict. Bar who is competent? Who is competent to speak about a thing? But the modern has taken it again and says, only an architect has the right and can is able to speak competently about architecture. So we have this schism, this schism has been described, and we have not overcome this schism. This is actually uh, all what I wanted to say. The rest is footnotes for erudition, and the rest is details for erudition. But the thesis is we are still within the crisis of modern schism. Thank you. 60 years. And that's uh, James Ackerman. Um, he was. Uh, going to be here himself, uh, very sadly he, he hasn't uh, been able to travel from the United States. Um, but he suggested, um, when we were first in contact with him, uh, that perhaps the most uh, interesting thing he could contribute was a film that he made with John Terry, filmmaker who's now at the Rhode Island School of Design, about Palladio and his influence in the United States. Now, this film itself is an interesting vignette because it was made in 1977. And although its subject matter is really the influence of Palladio on the antebellum uh, plantation houses, mainly in the southern states of the United States, uh, up to, uh, well, up to the Civil War, so up to the 1860s, um, there are also a few uh, references to what was then um, contemporary architecture. I think rather than uh, point them out, because I'm sure you'll spot them, let the film speak for itself. Um, but this is a, 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 a departure, obviously, for, for um, uh, James Ackerman, um, a, a very distinguished academic, normally used to the um, uh, sort of methods of uh, teaching and communication of a university, 
uh, actually breaking into uh, film. And this, I think, raises issues that may uh, come back in, in, in the discussion about uh, both the method and the uh, content of, uh, of the film. Um, the content is obviously a strand of Palladio's influence, as I mentioned, uh, particularly in the southern states of the United States. Um, and uh, in order to explain that influence, he has to say, he has to try and explain what it was that pal made Palladio so attractive in order to be influential. So the film um, cuts between uh, Palladio's buildings in the Veneto in northeastern Italy uh, and these buildings across the sort of southeastern uh, quarter of the United States. And of course the method is, is film, which allows that sort of cut to be made in a way that other media would, would find very difficult. It uses narrative, spoken uh, narrative in particular. It uses imagery, particularly moving imagery, film imagery. And of course it uses sound as well. Um, now, in order to try and uh, broaden out uh, the idea both of uh, Palladio's influence and the way Palladio has been read and reread, um, we are also going to show two films made by my colleague at the Royal Academy, Kate Goodwin, and the filmmaker Ruth Shock and Cats, uh, which are both very short um, and which were made in the last few months and are part of the exhibition which Kate has curated, uh, the, the sort of... Uh, uh, extension of uh, Palladio, uh, his life and legacy, um, which is called Palladio Through the Eyes of Contemporaries. And in these two films, two distinguished contemporary architects, uh, Arata Izazaki and Richard McCormack, uh, reflect on their relationship with Palladio and what they have picked up from Palladio in both cases through the course of what are now quite long careers over several decades. Now, we're going to see the, the Ackerman film first, um, and then after that, Kate will say just a very few words about her two films. So, thank you. Got to turn it on, sorry. Um, as Jeremy said, I was responsible for putting together a sort of contemporary response to Palladio. Um, and it, uh, some of you may well have seen the exhibition um, in the Royal Academy and this contemporary response actually sits outside of it. So I hope you maybe haven't missed it, but if you have, I have a little snapshot of it this, of, of this afternoon. Um, but it was to investigate, I think, some of the discussion which has come up here, which is the relationship that contemporary architects have with history. And it was choosing a selection of them from across the world and looking at how they might think about um, Palladio and Architecture 500 years ago. And um, I think it was very interesting, sort of in relationship to the film we've just seen here, which was a very literal translation, often in America, of, um, of how architects were using Palladio's work. And this project that we did in, at the Academy was to actually to go beyond a question of style, or not necessarily just to look at style, but actually look at how Palladio might have, you know, or has permeated architectural thinking and to sort of talk to a number of architects about this relationship they had. Um, it's done in two parts. Part of it was with um, pictorial essays which are shown in the Academy and the other part is through film interviews. Um, and it was through interviews of trying to talk to architects to have them articulate what it was that they felt um, interested them about Palladio, how they responded to his work, and how they then re related to this question of history. Um, the two we've chosen to show this, uh, this afternoon, which is, as I say, just a portion of what this project entails, um, are two that we felt really related to the discussion today of rereading, uh, of rereading Palladio. Um, the first is by... Um, is a discussion with Arata Isazaki. And the notion of rereading comes up a couple of times. He quite clearly talks about, he, he had the opportunity, I should say, to go to Vicenza and see the exhibition there um, installed in the Villa Barbaro. So he'd seen the material and he went around, I believe, with Howard and Guido um, to see the exhibition. And what became quite apparent in his discussion with us, which was about a sort of an hour-long, wonderful discussion. If you know Arata Isazaki, he's a very 
thoughtful, um, well-spoken Japanese architect, and he's got a very poetic way of speaking. And so we had to cut this hour-long discussion down to sort of five short minutes. But one of the things that really came out about it was the fact that he said that um, he didn't, he, you know, he was aware of Palladio's work. In fact, he was behind one of the first translations of um, the Quattro Libre into uh, from Japanese into uh, from e sorry English into Japanese, um, and that he found that it took him, you know, almost 30 years to really come to understand Palladio's work, and in fact that it was still a process that he was doing in going and seeing the exhibition. How he felt and thought about Palladio was still an evolving process, and he thought one that would continue which I think is quite an interesting sort of comment. Um, the other sense of rereading was in the fact that he refers to, and you'll see it in the film, a project that he did, um, the Fujima Country Club in Japan. And he said he did this, and he suddenly found that it looked incredibly similar to the Villa Poyana. And it was something at the time that he'd completely not seen, read, or thought he'd done. And I think it does raise some really interesting questions about an idea of influence and how Palladio might permeate the thoughts of architects and might come up again. Um, the second one we'll look at is a discussion with Richard McCormack and again the sort of reading um, related to a lot of what was discussed today because he did come out of the tradition and he very clearly states that his understanding of Palladio came initially from uh, Colin Rowe and Whitcover and then it's there that he's taking his thoughts forward, forward onto how it might relate to his own architecture. And he relates it to a building in Coventry that he did um, for the cable and wire, was the cable and wireless building, and which is now the network rail building. It's a training building in Coventry, and I must admit that you know, in discussion with him, I sort of had seen where he'd ideologically and intellectually moved through this, but it wasn't until actually going out to the building that it started to make sense and start to sort of resonate with me that I could understand how he was picking up and thinking about and digesting Palladio. And I think it does relate to some of the comments that have taken place already today. Uh, the words that came out in a lot of these interviews were very much the words, you know, things like translation. Um, and, I mean, as, as we'll hear, Richard very much places himself within a particular time, and he says, you know, architects of my generation are very susceptible to all kinds of historic, you know, influences. And I think it's quite an interesting point that now uh, that how we gain influence is a very broad thing, and our relationship to history becomes quite complex. Um, and that he feels that it should be um, translated into new and hopefully original kinds of syntax and so hopefully some of these points will come out and others which you'll see in the films. Um, they are probably a lot more modest than the <laughs> wonderful one we've just seen here of Ackermans. We didn't have a lovely helicopter to go over the uh, Veneto countryside, unfortunately. Um, it was a process of myself doing interviews with the architects and co-directing it and producing it with, as um, Richard said, um, a young filmmaker called Ruth Chock and Katz. And we had the... Um, and in collaboration with a, a, a third person, Nicholas Hornig, who did one of the other films that we won't see today. Um, but it also, we had some music commissioned uh, to accompany these pieces by Dov Waterman. And he was actually responding to having, knowing very little about um, architecture. He came in quite late in the process and responded to the interviews and what he saw and the personalities of the various architects. And each piece of music responds and picks up on this. So it is almost a, it's another translator, another response <coughs> to uh, the architect's relationship to Palladio. Um, so I think we'll have a look and see the first now. The first trip to Vicenza, when I was a student, I couldn't understand at all. I couldn't realize uh, how, the, uh, why people think that uh, Palladio is so important. <laughs> to, real, to understand that, uh, uh, this kind of importance, maybe for me it took 30 uh, years. <laughs> one, one day I beat uh, Redentore in Venezia. And I
we've had such treats today, um, but particularly with the films and, and all that. But we have got two more very important short presentations, and, and then it's your turn. So <laughs> anyway, do, do start, Alan. Mm. I've been, I've been asked to talk about um, what I know of the, of the, la la uh, the 1950s. Yeah, sure. um, <coughs> but I know of the, uh, of the influence of um, what I call um, Platonizing tendencies in the 1950s in England. Is that right? Um, <coughs> and <coughs> I will discuss three um, examples of, of this influence. Uh, and I'll talk very briefly uh, and uh, uh, not, not enlarge on any of the points I'm going to make. Maybe we can discuss some of them. Um, I think what, what happened in the 1950s um, was a search among the post-war architects in England, uh, those, who, those who, were, who, who started practicing in the 19, early 1950s, they were searching for what might be called an epistemology of architecture, which went beyond the mechanical and empirical functionalism <coughs> which was predominant in, in England at that time, um, <coughs> on the one hand, and on the other hand, went beyond the English landscape, picturesque tradition, uh, which also was very was very prominent, uh, which um, Nicholas Pesner, for instance, supported, um, and um, this search um, involved uh, an intense short-lived but very intense interest in theories of proportion. Um, <coughs> the, the first um, example of this I want to mention is the one which has been mentioned once or twice today, the idea of proportionality in Renaissance architecture which was the subject of uh, Rudolf Wittkover's book called Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism. It was published in 1949. This book was read widely by um, the post-war generation of arch architects in London. The most thumbed sections of it uh, are part three uh, the called the, the principles of Palladio's architecture, in which uh, Vitkova discusses the typology of the villas, and part four, which is called the problem of harmonic, ha harmonic proportion in, in architecture, where he defines the proportional system used by Palladio in the villas. The thing I think, one of the things that, that um, excited us about um, this book and about Palladio was the, the, the sense in which it presented um, an, idea, an idea of architecture which was independent from simply a collection of buildings, um, a system involving the notion of typology in which the, particularly in relation to the plans, in which a number of different versions of the same, essentially the same idea, are presented. <coughs> um, I just wanted to say one or two things about the book. Um, its main concerns are, are syntactic. He wasn't, that Kober wasn't in this book particularly in concerned with metaphor, metaphor and, uh, and allegory. And, uh, it wasn't until quite a few years after he wrote this book that the connection between language and architecture 